Hello everyone, this is update for May 15, 2024, day 812 of the war and of the date update. Also catch up for May 14 and 13. Uh, I'm gonna start with general strategic news and all oh, updates and then I'm gonna switch to uh, situation on the battlefield in Ukraine. Uh, so the uh, the first news and more of the follow-up on to what happened with the resignation of the Russian uh, Minister of Defense and appointment of a new one. So the team of the of the former one is being um, called dismantled. So one one of his deputy uh, was uh, arrested. Uh, there are a couple couple more decided to quit. So uh, essentially this uh, you know group of people who were um, I'd say. Um, more interested in um, personal gains than anything uh, as factually uh, has been removed. Uh, now you have uh, someone who is a little bit more, um, I would say, um, very restrained and more fanatical, um, but uh, sort of um, healthy dose uh, of uh, fanaticism, uh, not in unhealthy way. Um, and uh, it's, uh, I would say, in a short, um, the strength of this person is that, in a way, he is, um, you know, state-focused, state-minded, uh, government control, uh, and so on, uh, and also, obviously, big business, uh, monopolism, to in effectively, um, uh, at the same time, it in a short run, it may actually work for Russia uh, during you know wartime um, if it's done right. Uh, in the long run, it's extremely destructive those policies, and so the, there will be payback for all of this. Uh, but uh, it may happen sort of after the war uh, when there will be um, horrible results uh, from these decisions. Uh, but uh, the the key point that um, Russian president wants to achieve is he he wants to maintain um, social stability inside of Russia. So basically, he wants to insulate Russians from um, uh, from the consequences of war. Yet he wants to increase uh, military expenses and continue continue the war for the uh, for the long run. So uh, this is the basically challenge uh, for this new person. Uh, in you know, in some ways, he's uh, much more than uh, minister of defense. He's more sort of um, like person who oversees basically um, uh, Russian economy and uh, military industrial complex and how to integrate and make them more effective without reducing social benefits um, for Russian citizens. In, in some ways, this actually reminds um, how um, Hitler was waging uh, war uh, in, like, let's say, 1941, 1942, where there was a uh, desire to insulate Germans from, from sort of negative consequences of the war. Uh, which eventually failed, and you know, towards the end of '42 and really '43, it you know, uh, it all went out of the window, <clears throat> and then the the sort of all of the life standards went uh, went down, obviously, mm, and and sort of something similar. Uh, uh, what is Russian president is trying? Mm, in, in, in some way, you can even call this a sort of Russia's version of uh, Albert Speer. Um, not exactly sort of as, as history sort of uh, rhymes, but doesn't repeat. Um, where the focus is, as I stated, is more try to achieve uh, efficiencies without disturbing um, social sort of peace uh, in Russia. Uh, we'll see what happens out of it. Um, I'm somewhat skeptical that that's possible. Um, the other news is that Russian president is already in China. Actually, this new 
minister of defense, which, as I said, he's much more than minister of defense. He's sort of um, responsible for um, coordinating Russian uh, economy and, as I said, military industrial complex. So they both went uh, to meet with uh, Chinese president. As you can see, that that's probably um, you know introduction of a new minister of defense to uh, to the Chinese president, and you know continuing discussion on the next plans for the uh, for the um, Russia China Iran North Korea axis, uh, and what's going to happen next there. Um, now I'm going to switch to Ukraine. So what's going on in Ukraine is that uh, there is a mad scramble by Ukrainian political top to, um, I would say, to limit a negative outcome from disaster in, in Kharkiv uh, region. And not Kharkiv region, because there is also Kukansk Kharkiv region, but specifically... Um, uh, east of Kharkiv, uh, where we, as we all know, what happened uh, to the point that Ukrainian president had to cancel his trips to Spain and Portugal. Um, there are there are obviously scandals. You probably have seen it that the, mm, all of these defensive lines were not um, properly built, and it looks like the money were stolen, looted, and so on by actually um, Ukrainian president. Uh, appointee who is running um, uh, this you know, Kharkiv and, and Kharkiv region. So uh, there is extremely negative, let's say, political repercussions uh, out of this uh, for Ukrainian uh, president and state. Uh, the answer to this was uh, throwing everything that's available to plug the hole. Uh, and uh, in short summary, that for now that that succeeded in a short in a short run, uh, this succeeded. It's somewhat stabilized. Frontline Russian troops are not advancing uh, anymore. Even um, you know there are small, tiny uh, successes, and I'll discuss it once we get there. But it doesn't mean that situation turned around. It's just the balance. Uh, of power balance of forces tilted towards the Ukrainian side. Uh, so again, it's a it's, um, uh, quantitative solution to the problem, not qualitative solution to the problem. And that, in long run, it's a bad decision, it's a bad solution for Ukraine, uh, because, as I mentioned before, this is war of attrition, and, and you know, doing quantitative, you know, applying quantitative solutions for Ukraine is uh, means... Uh, uh, disaster in the long run and and, and, and losing this war and <clears throat> so that's why it's a, it's a temporary solution and uh, even the way it's being done it's, it sort of shows a lack of thinking because uh, it's basically um, garden variety of um, detachments from various, various uh, brigades so there are pieces from 92nd Brigade. There is there is everything there, pretty much. You know, whatever was available, some kind of reserve that's not the plot, not used on the front line elsewhere, it was pulled there. So uh, you have this uh, patchwork of various units, which is again a hallmark of um, uh, poor uh, poor military leadership, I would say, poor ability to. Sort of run run your business properly. Uh, there is no sort of order in in that house, and that's what's really happening there. Um, but uh, let me um, start going. Let me jump to this area and let's discuss what's going on there. So um, this uh, picture more or less uh, holds, except uh, Ukrainian forces control Neskuchna, this village. Uh, otherwise, this is more or less correct. So the the small uh, success that Ukrainian troops had was related to Ovchansk. This was about to be lost, where Russian troops managed to capture uh, northern, north, um, western part of the town, basically started advancing inside of the town. And because Ukrainian forces got this reinforcement, 
they managed to squeeze Russian troops on the edge of Wolchang. So the, the front line is back to where I showed it before. So this essentially for now it's, it's stable. The problem is, is that Russian uh, troops are trying to infiltrate in adva and, and advance on the flanks of Ovchansk, and most importantly uh, in this area, Tikhe uh, Ovchansky Hutori. Uh, if they manage to actually, um, um, you know, cross this this uh, sort of like a small river, like, um, like a little bit more than a stream, but uh, I would call it less than a river. Um, I think it's called Wovcha. So if they manage to cross it, that really is going to create a serious problem. Um, for uh, with chance and effectively it will make it will make it impossible to hold on to it for much longer um, so far ukrainian forces were successful in repelling uh, russians attempts to cross this tiny st stream we'll see what happens next uh, situation here on the uh, western uh, flank is somewhat better because it's better defensive positions it's in the forest there's a river Severs uh, Kedonets, which is a little bit bigger, so it's it's less threatened, but still uh, anything is possible in this situation. Uh, I want to mention one more important part in all of this Russian uh, attack is that uh, Russian command is using fairly limited amount of a number of forces, so this is not some kind of huge advance. And as I mentioned before, it's a small infantry unit, so basically infiltrating uh, into Ukrainian positions. And it's really uh, you know, infantry to infantry uh, fighting in general. Uh, obviously, with for Russian side, it's with the help of gliding bombs. That's one of the main tools uh, for uh, Russian attacks these days. Um, and I would say it, it had become more important uh, then, um, then artillery, which artillery is still playing key role, but uh, there is significant support um, for Russian troops from um, uh, from from this uh, gliding bombs, and it's espe especially effective in uh, urban fighting and uh, in this rigid defense lines that. Ukraine doesn't even have good ones, but whatever they have, they, they easily destroyed by this uh, gliding bombs, which I mentioned long, long, I don't think long time ago, but a couple of months ago, that this construction of this um, rigid defensive lines is uh, useless because uh, the Russian forces are not mere equal of the Ukrainian forces. And it worked for Russian side in the summer of 23, but it's not going to work for Ukrainian side. And so, uh, and that's really what's happening there uh, for now. But uh, a summary uh, situation uh, stabilized for now. Um, my feeling it's not going to be for long, but, um, but that's, that's the situation right now. Uh, this is this is uh, what I shown about the situation in Vovchansk. So uh, this is uh, the you know, prior situation and actually current. So Russian troops managed to uh, you know uh, advance and infiltrate into the town itself, but then they were repelled. And this is where that I mentioned that. Russian troops controlling this uh, tiny village Tehe and they attempting to cross the stream to essentially uh, create threat of encirclement and force Ukrainian troops out. And as you can see, it's quite a really dangerous situation because uh, Russian forces can control, controlling this village Bugruvatka. Uh, however, this uh, Siversky Donets here is a little bit uh, bigger river than this river Vovcha, and so this creates a little bit better sort of shield uh, on this side. But again, situation is uh, far from perfect, let's put it this way. Uh, now let's look at the situation on the North Luhansk front line. Uh, Russian troops uh, also pressuring here. The pressure is in typical location. 
uh, tower in direction towards Kupiansk on both sides of this road that goes there. Uh, so far, no major advances by Russian troops. Also, uh, you know, typical pressure here in this uh, forest area. But again, no major advances there either. Uh, now let's move to um, North Donbass front line. Um, so Russian uh, command is continuing their attempts to have sort of frontal squeeze in the direction of Siversk, uh, which is fairly uh, futile so far. At least there's no any major advances. Uh, now let's look at the situation uh, west of Bakhmut. Russian uh, troops uh, continuing so their pressure, they attempting to build sort of this northern pincer. Uh, it's going extremely slow. Uh, so uh, situation somewhat stab stabilized uh, for now. Uh, and it's just, uh, you know, long road for Russian side before they actually will create any real threat for the CVR. Now let's move to the situation uh, on the central Donbass front line where it used to be pretty uh, pretty critical. Uh, again, situation here also somewhat stabilized. Uh, so far, Russian troops uh, were not able to advance much further than where it shows, and this is since May 3rd. Uh, effectively, it's more or less uh, in the same sort of situation with the exception of women's care. Uh, where um, Russian troops control majority of the village, uh, Ukrainian forces basically on the western outskirts uh, of it. Uh, otherwise, there is no major, um, sort of, I would say, as aggressive moves as it used to be here for now. Uh, this is just big picture. Uh, the, the the pressure continues. It's not elevating, but uh, it's so far uh, no major breakthrough on the Russian side. Similar situation here uh, around Krasnohorivka. Russian troops continue uh, slowly <coughs> uh, capturing Krasnohorivka. It will take some time. So once they capture Krasnohorivka, it probably will be much more open territory um, and uh, that would that would make it easier for Russian troops to advance uh, there. Uh, and similar so far Russian troops broke down uh, west of Novomikhailovka. Uh, now let's look at the situation on the Parisia front line. And things here are sort of the same. Uh, Russian command is pressuring, still trying to uh, capture Robotina, which is almost there, but not quite. So there's still Ukrainian troops in the northern part of it. Uh, but, you know, it's very clear Russian uh, command is determined to uh, capture uh, Robotina. And similar situation is happening in Rajaina, just frontal squeeze pressure by Russian troops. Um, there is not much progress, Russian progress there in Orozhaina. Most of the um, village is controlled by Ukrainian troops. Uh, now let's look at the situation along the Dnipro River. Uh, things here are more or less the same, status quo. Uh, I don't expect any uh, you know, immediate changes here. Uh, there are uh, clearly rumors that Russian um, uh, troops are training or preparing to cross Dnipro River and establish bridgehead on the western side. Uh, I would say uh, I'm very skeptical. I don't think Russian side has enough forces or available forces to do anything uh, like that, especially given that they uh, started this attack um, uh, east of Kharkiv. Uh, again, also don't really can do, still cannot explain the logic behind it. What, what's a sort of military logic uh, can only explain it from just purely political perspective. But that's just uh, you know, politics is a different story. Uh, thanks again for listening. Uh, until next time, bye bye.